you cut in the end of that, it's going to, it just goes all over the place. Same, same principle. Yeah. Yeah, Luminsky uses a broom, mm -hmm. and he's mm -hmm. cut at an angle. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've learned that everybody does everything differently, <laughs> and I listen to what applies to me and what I like, and I'll use that. I can't think of an example, but. There's just a wealth of information here. People just come here to gather all this information. And um, I've learned for me that there's really no wrong way if you pay attention. There's just different ways with all you guys. That's okay, I have no comment after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, last, last winter I was in Florida and uh, Alan Lacer was there. And he said... Uh, that he had just gotten back from a court case and he was called in as an expert witness. Alan Lesser, I guess, pretty well, widely known. And uh, he, he said that they, uh, it was a production shop and they glued up something. I don't know, but it was a pretty good size. I don't know what it was for or anything. And there was a young younger guy turning, starting to turn it. And the boss came in and said, oh, you need to turn it faster. And he just turned it up a little faster. It was a glued up piece. And so the kid went ahead and he was turning. And the boss messed around here and there. And then he left. And a little bit, that thing blew up. And I think it almost killed the guy. So, so the police came and locked the shop down. Nobody was allowed to go in there. When he was called, he came in. And the first thing he did on the lathe, it was a uh, one way, I think, maybe. I'm not sure. But it had a, a display on the RPM. Mm -hmm. First thing he did is he checked the RPM. It's 3,200. Wow. Wow. My goodness. So he said that, that won the case right off. The police were there, and uh, the plaintiff's attorney and the defendant's attorney, and they all saw it at the same time. It was just. Nothing wrong with the lathe. No. Nope. And they were suing the lathe company. <laughs> well, I found out that wow. $59 spent for a metal detector is money <laughs> yeah. well yeah. spent. Uh, well, yeah, he bought that off me when I worked it. <laughs> yep, sure did. At Clingsport. Because I had to take uh, a half inch bowl gouge that I shortened by a quarter of an inch. He <laughs> said there was a 16 penny nail in the wall, yeah. totally covered over. He didn't know it, it. and it didn't cut across ways. It came right straight down. Oh. When it came right straight down, it took it out of the gouge. Wow. And it cost me about a quarter of an inch of metal on that gouge. Actually, about three eighths before I got past where I was comfortable with the crack. And took one look at that and said it's it's worth fifty nine dollars to just wave the wand over the piece and check it. Sure I've never found another nail, mm -hmm. but that's all right. It doesn't stop me from checking. Nope. Well, you can find anything. You can buy old bar bar, just about anything. Oh yeah. Yeah, and yeah. if it uh, if it clips, he comes flying. Uh, could embed itself. Probably will, actually. I don't know if he was there or not, but we was at the fair, and Jerry and I was taking turns turning on a hat. And I'm sitting there turning, and here's a click, click. <laughs> what in the heck was that? And turned the lathe off, and there's a nail in there. Wow. And we got the nail out, and it actually left a rust hole and everything else. And we turned the hat, and then put the nail back in the hole. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Now you just like touched that. on yeah. one other thing that we've all learned and nobody say. If you hear something or see something or stop. feel something that is out of the ordinary, stop and figure out what it is before you proceed. I watched uh, one of the better known truckers in the United States by a fellow by the name of David Ellsworth turning on a power map, which he's not used to. And 
pierced. <laughs> Stopped away, checked everything, looked it all over. Don't know what it is, I guess it won't bother anything. Turned the way back on. This little voice in the back of the room said, You've got the index screw in the Oh, collar. yeah, it's screwed in there. Uh huh. It's probably vibrating down. You'd better stop and take that out. Yeah. That stops the noise immediately. Mm -hmm. If it had gone a 60 foot turn further, you sure. had such an explosion, you wouldn't believe it. Yeah. That brings up rule number one. Face mask. Oh, yeah. your shoe. And I, I, I was, I've been wearing my shoe. Um, when I was down at the Georgia Symposium a year and a half ago, uh, my wife saw the trend in your shoe pro, insisted that I buy that, and within a month it paid for itself. Because it, it's, it's not as thin, flimsy as the yeah. regular shields. And it's, yeah, like that. These are good, but these aren't good. Yeah. <laughs> these are better than nothing. Exactly. This is extremely thick, this one. But at least get the ones that's got the plastic, the frame around it. Yeah. And uh, if you want to read a good story, read the uh, Lin Yamaguchi story in the AAW Journal this month. I hope that will wake you up. Oh, yeah, I saw that. We're in a uh, uh, riot. She now wears a riot. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Your turn. My turn. Uh, I don't know. I would say I usually get frustrated when uh, things fly off the lathe and uh, I disappear for five years and then I come back to work. <laughs> and it's funny because uh, when it came off the lathe the first time, I was in mode shop and then I was like, it hit me in the shoulder and I was like, well that's it. And so I walked away and I had other things to do besides just walking away. But um, and five years later, I said, Mo kept on trying to push me to get back into it. So I came back and it, there's this piece of wood on there going thump, 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 thump. And Mo's like, well, I'll cut most of that off for you and see, so I feel more comfortable. Well. This time around, that thing flew off the lathe and hit me again, but I kept on going. I wasn't so discouraged anymore. And uh, I just recently finished a 12 by 6 uh, small uh, workshop just for myself. My dad and I worked on it together and built an extension on the shed. And uh, I've got my own lathe now. And I got a piece of maple on there that's ornery, so I think forever to turn. So. Anybody else for more tips? Oh, I do have one more. Go ahead. Um, I mean, I've been a woodworker all my life. I've had a wood shop all my life. Uh, for those of you who've been in my shop, I, I'm trying to outdo Norm on TV. <laughs> uh, I even got a panel saw in there, and I. You know, so I got everything in there, and I still got all my fingers. Uh, the two closest things I ever had happen to me, I leave the after aftermath in the shop, so I remind myself not to be stupid anymore. And uh, one was a nail gun that I thought I was done with this project, and I had one more nail to put in, and I reached down underneath it because I just rolled the project back over it. I was actually building the set for the church, and when I struck the nail, it was a finishing nail, about that long, it hit a knot, came out, actually ricocheted off my glasses, and my shop's 24 by 38, so it's a pretty good sized shop, ricocheted off my glasses, went as far as from here to the door and stuck in the wall right above the thermostat. So I leave it there, so whenever I adjust the thermostat, I see it. <laughs> then the other thing, I was actually cutting these planks. And I never let Linda behind me when I'm cutting them on, cutting anything on table saw. I always stand off to the side from the blade, never stand directly behind it. One of them bound up, and I got a square hole that big in my drywall right behind the table saw. 
It went through the wall, through the drywall, and pushed the siding out on the outside. Wow. So it's got some force coming out of there. So don't let anybody behind you when you're cutting. And don't stand behind the saw when you're cutting. Because even the small things hurt. And remember, if you think your tool might be sharp, it does. It does. Yeah. Okay. Um, Bo asked me a few weeks ago, actually when we was at Roland Memorial, uh, if I'd come and do this demo, and I asked him what he wanted, and, and we couldn't come up with something, and he said, well, you've done pepper mills before, and I said, yeah, but I've, I've been thinking it over, and one of the things you always got to remember is you get new people into a club now and then, or you might not have done a pepper mill, but now you decide to do one or something like that, so it's good to refresh yourself on stuff every once in a while. Because I've changed a few of my techniques since the last time I've done pepper mills, or the last time I demonstrated pepper mills here. But you're always, I'm always trying to come up with different techniques, and I'm always trying to come up with different theories behind some of this stuff. And uh, I mean, my mind is always trying to come up with new things. And in fact, I get up and write stuff down in the middle of the night at times because I think about it, so I do it. But uh, uh, safety-wise, like I said, I already told you about the wedge that I don't like in the end of the thing. Um, I actually rounded these off and put a tent on each end. I started out with a blank like this, which when I make these blanks, um, like I said, tonight we're thinking out of the box on some of this stuff. Uh, I just take scrap wood that I got, you know, that I might have built a small project or something. I got some of this cherry or something like that left over. Cut them, glue them together. But whatever color you start with, let's say you start with a darker color, end with the light color. Okay, if you start with a light color, end with a dark color. Reason being, the first cut you're going to make, and it's all according to how steep of an angle you want these, the first cut you're going to make is going to be, let's say, from here down to this corner, okay? Cut that on the bandsaw or something, then you can lay these up against your fence and just cut them off with your table saw. But you're going to end up with a wedge on this side, and you're going to end up with a wedge on this side. You can glue the two wedges back together and you got another blank, so you don't waste anything, as long as you do the opposite color when you start out, okay? One of the other things that I didn't get it done, I got it glued up, but I'm trying it. And I've already made a small bowl out of it. And this is getting into that thing of thinking out of the box a little bit. Um, a lot of you guys know what OSB is, right? Putting on the roof, nail your shingles down. OSB is some of the most beautiful stuff if you turn it, but you got to turn it careful. You can have a lot of speed. But I glued some OSB together and I'm going to make pen blanks out of it. And it actually looks like straw when you turn it. Looks like a bunch of straw. And uh, what's his name at uh, Charlotte? Does real thin vessels. Uh, David? David. He did uh, a vessel similar to your, your uh, pine over there. Only it just came up. But it was only a little over an eighth of an inch thick, and it was OSB. And half the people in there could not figure out what it was at first. But it's beautiful, beautiful stuff. And when you're gluing any of this stuff together, um, I've done a lot of testing on it. David's done a lot of testing on it. We came up with the same conclusion. Um, sand it with 80 grit sandpaper. Okay, what I do is I got a piece of Corian at home that I glued a piece of 80, 80 grit sandpaper to it and I'll just sit there and lap it a little bit. Uh, you cannot turn it or sand it real smooth and expect the glue to hold. You need to, you need to have some roughness there for the glue to hold to it. So sand it. We found out that 80 grit sandpaper is perfect. I actually run mine through, I got one of them big belt sanders at home and I'll run it through there and it puts the scratches in it. 
put the glue on it, and I've never had anything come apart. So, and even you your just, stuff that you glue up. You just, just wipe the white glue? I'm just using, uh, yeah. The yellow. Yeah, yellow. the, uh, type oh, on. Type yeah, type on. on. Yeah, thank you. My thumb timers kicks in every once in a while. <laughs> but uh, I just use tight bond on it, and please don't rush it. And well, it says it sets up in an hour, but it's set overnight. There's nothing that needs to be turned that quick. Nothing. Trust me. So, I mean, I'm not. It's not an excuse. I'm not used to this late, but I got to slow it down some more because we're going to drill first. When you're drilling, you want some low, low speed. If that drill bit starts getting hot, you're going too fast. And, by the way, I made some handouts for you guys. And I apologize on the one thing, I was going to bring a rolling pin too. And, uh, because I got a handout on rolling pins, which you guys can more than welcome to take. And I actually brought some plain paper and pencils up here, if anybody wants to put any notes down. But uh, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything with the right hand pepper mill on that sheet. But you can see I changed some of the measurements on the left hand one. Um, I don't know. Maybe this is just my thinking, but. I think they come up with some of these things so they can sell drill bits and that because who has an inch and nine sixteenths drill bit at home and who has a, you know. So I figured out a way to do it that I haven't had a bit of problem with any of these pepper mills. That pepper mill right there is my daughter's and she's had it what three years now probably, three or four years. And it does have pepper in it right now so be careful with it, it's red pepper. So. <laughs> But well, we're going to start out, and we're just going to drill an inch and three-quarter hole in the end of this. We're going to go in, I think the plan say for five-eighths of an inch. It's not that important. The only thing you have to do... Let me get my pepper mill out here. The only thing you're going to do with this first drill is between... This ridge and this end, you just want it deep enough to where that's not going to set on the table. So if this is up an inch inside there, it doesn't mean anything. You just don't want this gray part sticking out the bottom. That's the biggest thing it is. So if you look at this, if I go in the depth of this drill bit, I think that's about five eighths of an inch actually. Yes, I am. I, I haven't had a bit of problem with the ceramic mechanisms. Uh, if you use some of the uh, metal ones, you got to be real careful um, if you got salt in them. And that's one of the reasons I don't use the ones that's got the bar going across the bottom. The, I mean, I'm not knocking the mechanism. Don't get me wrong there. But I just don't like them because the salt going down on it, you know what salt does the stuff. And... Uh, I just like these. I've had real good luck with these, so why reinvent the wheel when it when it works? Like I said, we're going to think out of the box a little bit tonight because uh, there's a couple things I'm going to do that. Uh, a couple of things I'm going to show you that uh, some of the things I'm working on right now. This is actually turning too fast for me, but that's the lowest speed that this will go. One of the things I'm working on right now is I actually got. And some of you guys probably have one. If you got a chainsaw at home, one of the little chainsaw sharpeners you get from Harbor Freight. I'm working on a fixture right now where you can take the fixture off that holds your chain 
And you can put these Forstner bits in and sharpen the Forstner bit with the chainsaw sharpener. I think it'll work. Because I always I sharpen these myself now, but I sharpen them by hand. What are you okay. sharpening them with? Well, it's by hand, but it's one of the rotary files, but on the cutoff disc. And I go in there and I just touch the back side of or the front face of each one of these little tits. Yeah, I've been using it like a small diamond cone. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's too slow for me, so I go with well, it. <laughs> okay, now we're going to we're going to go in with the inch. And if you, sorry, I'll be right back. If you look, it's going to be close by the time we get down in there to the height, to the depth of this. So. But, if you think about it, we don't really need to drill all the way through this, because all that one inch hole is in there for is to hold the salt or the pepper or whatever. So I can drill part of this from one end, flip the thing over, finish drilling it from the other side, and if it's off just a tick, who cares? You're not going to see it, as long as it's not off a bunch. Okay. So if you get it squared on in there, if I had a longer chuck, I'd be okay because I can go pour it through. Um, one of the other things, and maybe somebody could come up with something, I'm always watching when I go into stores on different stuff, I'm trying to find me a small salt shaker because what I'm planning on doing is telling some of the other guys, I want to make the top about a third of the overall thing. And actually recess the pepper or the salt in the top, grind the pepper and have the salt come out the top. But I want something that looks nice too and doesn't distract from. You can buy little vials right now. But they get too much money for them. Actually there's a, I think it's Penn State Industry sells a kit that does that for a pepper mill about five and a half inches iron. Yeah. Oh, the, the one you just yeah, yeah. popped, yeah. That was worth it, too, actually. Yeah. I'm just going in with... I'm just going in with the inch now. What I wish I would have done was actually drilled another set of these today so you don't have to sit here and watch me drill. But, uh... When I rough these in, I'll just barely rough them in just to get them round. It's way bigger than I want. Because one of the other things you always got to consider is not that the kids is going to be using a pepper mill that much with their small hands, but some of the other, some of us older people might have arthritis or something like that. So you always want to be conscious of it conscience on size and stuff like that so it's not too small where they can't grab a hold of it but yet you don't want it too big where they can't hold on to it you know you got to hit that kind of happy medium where it works good for the uh The other thing is that you can see that this this blank I have here is a lot longer than I need. Don't worry about leaving some waste up here. That waste is going to do two things. It's going to keep you from getting into your truck for one thing, but also keep them waste blocks that's got a tenon on already. It makes a perfect glue up block if you want to take a little piece of wood to it. You already got the tenon on it. It's already round. You can glue something up to it or if you got one that's about, that's about three inches in diameter, make it nice and flat, put your piece of velcro on it, and then you got a nice little sanding pad that fits in your truck. Or get a six inch one and get six inch six. So, the last thing you can make is you don't have to buy.
our ending move drive zero one of these ahead of time. Then you can tell it's not really taking that long. If anybody has any questions as we're going, just rattle them off. I can do two things at once. At times. hot in here, just let me know I'll turn the AC back on. I got it right on the roof. Hey, you can turn that on if you want. I can speak up. How's that? 
I'm just going to use this drill bit as a center. So I tighten this up. Now remember, I'm expanding now. So I'm trying to pull that wood apart, so you don't want to put a lot of pressure on this. All I want that is to just to hold it so it'll turn. Now I'm going back to my inch and finish turning that through there. because I haven't got to cut the length. Okay. I could actually go through right now and cut this the length, but I just like getting the hole all the way through there.
One of the things I made, I'm going to find it, is um, this is a little step thing that I put in the, the tailstock that I, I use this on pepper mills, I use it on uh, uh, kaleidoscopes. Because even the kaleidoscopes, even though it's three pieces that come together and you got a triangle in the middle, you know, you just turn this to where it just fits in that triangle. Well, if you think about it, when you're pushing now, you're pushing on this collar here, and you're pushing it straight in. To where, if you use a cone down here, now you're trying to split it open, plus it damages this end. I do have to check. Hey, it fits. I called one of my students last night because I'd actually lent him my cones that I use on both ends. And uh, called him up, find out if I can get them back for this demo. Come to find out he was laying in the hospital because they had to put a stent in the heart. So. so not saying I'm a jinx, but my buddies have been having trouble lately. We're going to do, I could have, when I had this turned around, cut it to length, uh, did the whole thing. Sometimes I do it that way, sometimes I do it this way. I mean, it's just, um, I don't know, it's all according to the way I feel. You know, don't get in a rut. The other nice thing, somebody had asked me about these these uh, pepper mills are the mechanisms that I use. The other thing I like about them is you can buy a short one that's just like this and it costs you just about the same money as this tall one does when all you have to do is cut this off, you know. And I'm actually uh, got a man and why he wants it, I have no idea. He wants a five foot pepper mill. <laughs> well, I'm going to turn him a five foot pepper mill and I'm just going to take this aluminum piece off and put another one in. Oh, okay. Let's see, it's bigger than anybody else's. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> he wants it, he wants it for his brother in law that owns a restaurant. Wow. Oh, it's one juicy rich everybody in the table. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I had to call her. Who's making the crane? Yeah. <laughs> maybe the waitresses. Maybe the waitresses wear some special outfit when they reach up that tall and do this. I don't know. Yeah, Jack, I'd seriously consider putting a PVC sleeve in there for that long. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good idea. Joe mentioned to me tonight that he actually puts a PVC sleeve on in the inside of these. Drills it off and puts it in there. And it uh, uses one of the other things it does, it, besides sealing the inside up, it gives you good bearing rest on the on the one end instead of against the wood. Yeah. Use the V-track, it's real thin wall, it's not, it's, it's got to be about 20, uh, real, real thin wall, V-track, V-track stuff, it's real thin, and it works <coughs> By the way, when you part these off, this is something you can try, okay? An old guy told me this, and I tried it, and it works. Start with your parting tool up a little bit. Go in there and kind of mark your wood, then bring it down and shove it in. And what it does is just like uh, taking a Stanley knife and scribing a piece of wood, cross grain or something first. It breaks them edge grain so it doesn't peel up. You try that, try it both ways on a piece of wood, just a practice piece of wood, and you'll get a lot less splinters if you hold this up, start it, and then go in with it, because it, it, it doesn't really cut the grain that much, but it kind of crushes the grain enough to where it doesn't peel up. Anymore. One of the other things
things you're going to find out when you're gluing wood together. You got different wood densities. That's what that chattering noise is that you hear. It's just different wood densities. I use a lot of 
bits at home also, but it's got the number two horse tape yeah. on it. Okay. Now this, yes, is going to be a little touchy. Um, yes.
So never use these on cross grain turning. Like I said, there's a few guys out there that says, oh, there's no problem, there's no problem. Well, yeah. you never do it in my shop. Yeah, I got two broken ones in my drawer over there. It's used in the shop. These broke? Two of them. Yeah. Okay, we got our we got our length. We got our length about right. And like I said, you can vary on these a little bit. All you gotta do is trim that thing off. You know, so the only reason I'm trying to make this one pretty close to this one is because my daughter ordered another one because they use they they're big into garlic pepper, so they want one for garlic pepper. So I gotta make her one for garlic pepper since I was doing the demo, I figured I might as well start it at least. But we got our whole, uh, about the only other thing we need to do right now before I, no, we don't need to do that right now. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and get a, get a rough measurement here. Ah, top ain't on it. There's a red pepper on the floor. Save it for the squirrels. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Oh. That's about a lot of All I'm going to do is rough this down a little bit.
There's that top measurement. I just want to double check this. I'll pass this 
around the second is what groove that these tabs fit into. That's what that groove for, and there's a groove at the top that this tab fits into. Well, I got to looking at that. The only thing I don't like about them grooves, wood don't taste bad either. The only thing I don't like about them grooves is once you push that thing in there and it locks in, there's no way you're going to get it back up. Okay? Uh, basically what I did, and I'll pass this around when I'm finished turning, if you look at this, I left, I left two of them on top. I actually ground that groove, or that tab off of this one, and the bottom, uh, I took one of the one of the tabs ground off, the other one's still there so you can see it. And there's little ridges that stick out here, and I, I file them off. What I do is I, I take them off, and when you go to install this thing in them, I shove it up in there, get a good seat up in it. I take a small bead of, of uh, five minute epoxy, and I put a small bead right around this ridge right here. It won't come back out. If you have to get it up for some reason, you can reach down in there at the night, you can cut that bead, you can get the thing back out of there. So if the mechanism does go bad, you can get it back out of there. With them ridges in there, I don't know how you get it out of there. But I've never had trouble with it. I, one of the first ones I done, I did it with the ridges, the grooves I should say. And after they used it for a while, they started turning, so I had to pull it in anyway. I made a They will come out? Yeah, but you got to hit it, and there's no damage to it. I was surprised. Oh, I, I've never... The reason I learned that, I put it in by mistake when I was building it, and I put it in there. I didn't need to snap in. But I have a little tool that I stick up in there, and I actually cut a, cut a groove in it. Yeah, well, I got I got a tool that I made. I make a lot of my own tools, and when we... I guess we'll take breaks in short a little bit. Uh, come up, as you can look at all these tools up here. But, but I, if you have a way of getting it... A rod or something down there, they will come out. Oh, okay. Yeah, you gotta hit them. But you can't, I don't think you can do it with the rod, the ones with the rod, but they make that same mechanism just in the base unit without the rod. Yeah. And it works fine. All I, right, I, I, I never knew you could get them back out of there because yeah. I, I couldn't figure out how to get them out of there. <laughs> shop doing a demo on a Saturday on how to use a skew and uh, I'd actually just got done making a small Japanese bowl and somebody had asked how small of stuff you can make with it well I turned on a set of chopsticks for the bowl and didn't have any trouble with it well then Ed turns around and turns a toothpick <laughs> Jerry turned around and turned the toothpick with a captured ring on it. <laughs> so you can you can get very small with these things. 
with the skew. They work great. Just uh, take your time with them. And you definitely can't get it sharp enough. All I'm going to do is mark for this uh, this last recess right here, and I'm going to put that in real quick. And then I can put that bead on, then I can do the skew work. Okay, we're just going to put a small bead on this. And the, the shape of these things, the size of them, doesn't really matter as long as you don't go smaller than one inch. Go smaller than one inch, you're going to have a bunch of pieces in a hurry. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I don't embarrass myself. It's been a while since I used a skew, but we'll try. two streaks of epoxy there, mix it in one side only in the catalyst, not the hardener, in the catalyst, catalyst is the one <coughs> hardener the other, right? 
Mix it in with the catalyst first. Mix it in and it'll almost get like uh, almost like cake dough or pie dough. It gets pretty lumpy, pretty heavy. Don't worry about it. It's fine. When you mix the hardener in it, it gets real soupy again. So it'll get real clumpy and everything else. But as soon as you mix that hardener back in with it, and uh, I just smeared it in there, turned it on the lathe, and ended up with a different design in it. I'm going to stop right here on this because this is basically <coughs> done except for sanding and finish shaping and getting the wrinkles out of it that I got in it. Uh, so let's, let's take a little break and, and uh, we'll do the top. And then I want to show you a couple other things. Like I said, you got to think out of the box at times. And I'll show you how I think out of the box at times. Um, the lid basically, and I apologize because I was sitting here thinking one thing and listening to some of the comments in the audience and doing another thing. This particular pepper mill that I made, I didn't drill the inch and a half hole in it. I left it an inch and I made this tenon on it. So when somebody says, are you going to drill the inch and a half hole? If I drove it in, I shouldn't have. So it doesn't matter. All I got to do now is cut that tab off of it and I'll be back to where it's fixable. Anything's fixable. Um, <laughs> Basically, the reason you want to turn this part first is because, and you sand it, you get everything done. Now, when you take your other chunk of wood, you drill your hole for your center part, and then you start recessing it, but you can recess it to where it fits tight on that tenant that you're going to put on there. Okay? So it'll fit down over top of it tight. You don't want it to where you can't turn it. You know, you don't want to squeak it. And remember, when you put a finish on it, that's going to take up some space. So, you know, you don't want it real sloppy back and forth, but yet you don't want it to where they can't turn it. And, uh, and basically, like I told you earlier, all I do is I cut them tabs off there, I'll put a little epoxy on it, and I shove that up in there and epoxy them in. I epoxy this in. I packed the mechanism at the other end, and it's basically, that's what you get when you get done. This has got to be trimmed off a little bit. On your, uh, just like anything else, if you're making a lid box or something like that, one of the surfaces, it's hard to get the both surfaces exactly 90 degrees. So make the surfaces a little concave going in just a little bit. Not much, just a little bit. That way when it sets down on there you don't have a big gap in here. It's just like this piece here and I can pass it around. If you look at it, this surface here and this, this surface is more, but this surface here is just a little bit concave and this one's concave. So when it puts down on there you can't really see the seam when you get done. So you gotta you gotta watch for things like that. Because like I said, trying to get it exactly nine degrees, it's hard. Okay. Now we're gonna think out of the box just a little bit. Uh, first thing, got a test question. Anybody even know what this is for? Yeah, you can be quiet. James Jug. Nope. It's a tool. Does anybody plant gardens? <laughs> My daughter happens to plant a lot of gardens. And she grows her own seed. She grows her own plants. She plants her seeds. Just take a piece of newspaper. And you wrap it around there. You fold over the bottom. Mm -hmm. 
you stuff it in there. And I usually take a small piece of scotch tape just to put on the seam. Now you got a seed cup that you plant your seeds in, and then when you go to transfer it, you just plant the whole thing in your garden. Oh. And you grow your seeds. Okay? And like the design is done on the roses. Yeah. That's not I want you to look at this when you get done. This is just a simple design on here. That's not um, outside the box, that's outside the cylinder. Yeah. <laughs> um, Roland, when he was. Uh, Roland made, we was talking about earlier, what they call a rose engine. I'm sure most of you have seen it. Yeah. Uh, well, I was actually, Roland and I made them together. He made one, I made one at the same time. But, uh, and I got one at home and I'll do decorative designs on my kaleidoscopes uh, and stuff like that. But his shifter knobs would really go good with the design on it. Yep. How many people do wood burn? In their parts. I mean, people would like to do it because they, but they don't want to try it because they can't draw. <laughs> I got a solution for you. It, uh, I mean, I can draw, but I just don't want to sit there and take all the time. And like right now, one of the big things is like wheat stock and uh, dragonflies, stuff like that. Well, my daughter happened to be down at the beach with us last time we was down there. And she was making some things. And what she was making was coasters. That she got these rubber stamps. I got all these at AC Moore's and they were two bucks a piece. Two bucks for a pad of them. And a pad of them comes with all kinds of designs. Okay? Well, the nice thing about these. Take them out of here and you normally put this to a piece of acrylic and then you can stamp. These things are real flexible. Okay? Let me get my pad. What did I do with it? It was in the box. I know. Check it out. It's up here. Here it is. They got all different colors of ink pads. Ben Franklin's got them, A.C. Moore's, like I said, I, we found these at A.C. Moore's and they are all two bucks for a pad full of that stuff. Michael's and Dave's? Yep. You got your wheat stock on there and now you just go through and wood burn over the top of it. Wow. Oh, that's nice. that's I not see fair. <laughs> Like I said, you got to think out of the box at times. So what do you call them? They're, they're just stamps. They're, uh... Like stamp pads, but they're just like... They're stamps. Don't say, don't be stamps. That one I got because it had all kinds of designs on it. Here. Oh, well, it's not in there anymore. Oh, no. I was going to do the dragonfly for you, but it's going to come off. It's in the Leave it in the bridge. Here, we'll try this one. Is that can stand. Well, I'll be I wish I had invented that. Like I said, you gotta... Hey, here I got something out of this newspaper. While you're talking real, real intelligent stuff there, I was reading. <laughs> When you glue your, your stuff together, it wants to slide. The glue wants to slide. Mm -hmm. the guy says put a few grains of either coarse salt or sand 
over the in the in the uh, blue. Yeah. Then that makes it so it doesn't slide. Yeah. If you use if you use salt, salt will dissolve. Then we're saying it's going to leave you that little gap in there. So oh. I recommend salt. That's pretty nifty. But. Um, You can have Jack leave that, that thing right there for a while. But this really is the bulb. Oh, the bulb? Yeah. Here. That's, this is what they look like when you when you get them. I mean, you can peel any of them out of there. That butterfly might have some red or some ink on it yet. But. Uh, but it just works so good, and you can use them over and over again. And like I said, we went in and found a whole tub full of them things that was two dollars a piece, and I got some with lace design. Really? I even got some that's got uh, well, here's some Halloween stuff. The only reason I got the Halloween stuff was I happened to like that swirly thing that was on the end there. Here's some here's some letters. But see, they got all okay. kinds. You name it, they got a stencil for it. Okay, I don't want to name it. But you don't want to get to ones that's already affixed to a block. You want to get these. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the last thing I want to show you, some of the guys might have seen this already. Some of the guys might have seen this already, but uh, I do I do a demo at Swing Sports Extravaganza every year for uh, Easy Tools. Okay. Um, about three years ago, I bought the buffer, okay, that I was going to put a motor on. It literally sat on top of my toolbox for a year. A year almost to the day, because the day before I was supposed to go back and do the demo for the next year, I'm out in the shop getting ready and everything else, and I'm sitting there and I have to look over that demo, and I look over, and I got two variable speed lathes there, and I thought, well, you dummy, because I wanted the motor that had variable speed on it. Now, I can't physically run on this leg because this has got a one inch shaft on it. All I did was put a plate on the bottom of it. This is, a piece, this is one of them flanges like you put for mountain pipe. Here's a piece of pipe and you got to put your leg and just sand it a little bit because it's just a little bit too big. That goes in there. This screws onto your lathe. The only thing I haven't taken time to do yet is I'm actually going to turn one out of wood, the pulley. You put it on there, you go to tighten the belt up, you just pull back on your banjo, tighten it up, and you got a variable speed buffer. <laughs> and you don't have another piece of equipment, not saying anything bad about your husband, but you don't have another piece of equipment taking up space in the shop because you can store this. Okay? This thing costs $99. Um, I got a cling sport, but it's actually made by Shopbox. So anybody that sells Shopbox, you can get these, and they run right at ninety-nine dollars. And the pads I get down at uh, Harbor Freight. Yeah, good old Harbor Freight. But I use this to do all my buffing. It'll fit on either one of my lathes. I got a power bank and I got a jet. And all. It'll fit on either one of them. Uh, I showed some of the guys. I pull off strips of sandpaper and I twist them with my uh, electric drill, rechargeable drill. I just twist each one of them. And I use this when I'm sanding down in the grooves and everything else. And they last for a long, long time. I've made a bunch of these. And there's one other thing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody goes out and buys the Beetle system and everything else. 
it's just a piece of wood, tannin on it, piece of wood up in here, screwed it down to it. These pads I get down in Harbor Freight again, you get like three of them for two or three bucks. Put it on there. This is what I use to buff my bowls and everything with. And when I got small stuff like ink pens, stuff like that, all this is, is a piece of wood with a tenon on it. I bring the tailstock up. This is a paint roller, fluffy paint roller. Set there, and you can you can actually put a sharpie mark across here if you don't trust yourself, and you can put one compound here, another compound here, and it'll last a long time. So I'm not trying to put anybody out of business, but why you overspend when you don't have to? And these you just pop off and throw them away every once in a while. Do you think that's a Anything to save money. Well, it's, just, it's, just nice, it's just nice stuff. Very good, thank you. The, the one last thing that I know everybody here that's got a chuck usually, probably, has done one of two things. They either got a set of dividers for the measure of the chuck. So they get the ten at the right size, or they got a board that's cut that they can drop over top of it. I didn't bring it with me, but all I got is I took a a uh, contractor's pencil, one of the square ones. My small chucks just happens to be if I lay the contractor's pencil across this right here. For my small chucks, you can go up and you can touch the end of it, and it's perfect size. But on that same piece of, uh, same contractor's pencil, I got a block of wood on one side of it. That's the reason I use a contractor's pencil, because it's square. The block of wood, when I flip it over, is the right size putting on top of here for my big, ch big chucks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you go bald listen to stuff like that, won't you, Mo? <laughs> It's just, it's just simple stuff that, to make your life easier, just put it on there and tap it and it's done. You don't have to measure nothing, you don't have to put your hands down there and spin and stuff, you just hit it and you're done with it. Somebody will kill him, it's dancing on <laughs> Any questions at all? I got business cards anytime my shop is always open to anybody that wants to stop in. Stop in. And Where are you located? <laughs> right next yeah. to Lowe's Motor, Charlotte Motor Speedway. They keep changing the name on me. Right next to Charlotte Motor Speedway. I'll give you a call first, so I'll come by. Yeah. Yeah, you can hear them right here. I mean, you might, you might find some kitchen cabinets being built in there. You might find some stuff being turned in there. You might find some wiring harnesses being built in there. So, but I love doing this stuff. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. People have used the wood turner's finish. It's great, great stuff. Um, but it's like, how much is it? Twenty-five dollars a quarter, or something like that. Twenty-four dollars a quarter. Pretty expensive. Yeah. If you go to Lowe's, <laughs> if you go to Lowe's, I was even going to bring a gallon that's just set up here. It's called Verithane. It's a V A R V E R V A R E T H A N E. It's called Verithane. It's a water base. You can get it in gloss, semi gloss, or satin. And it's actually a water base floor finish. So it's super hard. Okay? It's the exact same thing as Wood Turner's finish when you look at the compounds. And it's $45 for a gallon of it. He's handy to have around, eh? Who, who, I use a lot of it. Who wants a cork? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, what, what, that's what the wood turner's finish was originally for. for. Yeah. yeah. Now this one, this one, this bowl right here, and you can look at it real quick. It's knit. I turned it. I put two coats of wood turner's fin or verithane on here. And I haven't sanded it, but I'll sand this with like 1500 and I'll put one more coat on it and it'll be done. But you see how shiny that is. Oh, and yeah, you can put beautiful. this stuff on with a rag, you can put it on with a foam brush, you can put it on there, anything. And it is hard when you get done. Do it, turn it? 
when it's when it turns. That's, thank you. Put it on when it's spinning. This I just brushed on with a foam brush. Oh. That's the dry time. Uh -huh. Is it, Put it on the dry yeah. Yeah. Or is it yeah. Oh, yeah, dry yeah. dry. Yeah. 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 Within yeah. five or ten yeah. minutes, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. And oh, nice. you can put two coats on. I put two coats oh, on this and put some ice. That's awesome. What journal's yeah. journal? Yeah, it goes on right here. I don't know. I think it's just this month, isn't it? Oh, oh, mine came from the same. Yeah.